Before science workshop, here is an announcement for teachers. To support the ideas in today's programme, a free coloured booklet is available for teachers from this address. I.E. Finch, 67A Walwood Road, Leytonstone, London, E11, 1AY. Please enclose a stamped, addressed, A5 sized envelope. This is what we think the first bread looked like. Thousands of years ago, someone discovered that certain kinds of hard seeds, when soaked, would soften and stick together, and when heated, would make a kind of hard seed bread, like this. Later, a simple grinder was used to break down the seeds, to make a softer, smoother bread. By Egyptian times, a wheat called emma wheat was being grown. The wheat grains were ground with a heavy stone into rough flour. This was used to make small flat loaves for baking in a beehive oven. Around 3000 BC, also in Egypt, wine was being added to the dough to make it rise. About 2000 years ago, the Romans had improved bread making and the Wheaton and the cottage loaf were brought to Britain. Later the Spanish brought their ship bread to this country. And by Tudor times, the manchette and the pot bread were the top white loaves. When tin mining began in the 19th century, the white tin loaf became popular. And today, it's just one of the range of loaves made in a modern bakery. To find out more about the different varieties of bread, I went along to Manchester earlier this year to the National Bakers and Confectioners Exhibition. Well, this exhibition takes place about every four years, so it's only at an exhibition like this, when all the best bakers display their bread, you get an opportunity to see the hundred or so varieties of bread baked in the UK. just your traditional shaped loaves that you find here. The bakers also get a chance to show their skills and produce some amazing shapes. Different types of flour used to make white bread, brown bread, and my granary that you saw last week, all come from wheat grains. To find out how we get flour from grain, Lillian went along to the Flour Millers and Bakers Research Association in Chorley Wood. This is a special milling machine with a clear plastic front so you can see exactly what's happening. First of all, the machine has to be turned on. And the rollers begin to turn. The roller on the left turns at half the speed of the one on the right. This splits open the wheat grains when they pass through the gap between the rollers. First of all, the wheat grains are poured in at the top and then they pass down through the machine. When the machine is switched off, you can see that the grains have been broken into pieces. 
The sharp edges on the rollers have split open the grains, and if we look closely at just one grain, you can see that the white food store is still attached to the bran. The next stage is to separate the white from the bran. To do this, the broken grains are fed through two more sets of rollers. These rollers have smaller and smaller edges. The edges gradually scrape away the white food store from the pieces of bran. And this is the bran with the food store scraped away. At each stage, the bran and white are separated by sieving. The large bits of bran can't pass through the holes in the first sieve. The lumps of white can't pass through the holes in the second sieve. The final stage is to crush all these lumps of white in the milling machine. And this time, the rollers are perfectly smooth. Well, that's fine for white flour, Lillian. What about brown? What about my granary? Well, David, different types of brown bread are made from flour with different amounts of bran and white. And your granary is made from everything. Bran, white, embryo, the lot. Thank you, Lillian. Turning flour into the millions of loaves that are eaten every day is a modern factory process. First, 126 kilos of flour are mixed with water, salt and yeast to make a bread dough. The dough is split into pieces, each piece just the right weight for a standard loaf. This machine is called a prover. Here, the dough begins to rise on its way to the oven, where it's baked for 30 minutes. Suction pads remove the loaves from the tins, and they're checked for shape and colour. Three hours later, they're cool enough to be sliced and wrapped. But how do the bakers know if the bread they're selling is what the customer wants. One company has a panel that regularly tastes bread. First, they mark one loaf. They give marks for overall flavour, moistness of the crumb, and hardness of the crust. They mark on a scale of one to ten, and this loaf is called the control, the loaf they'll use to compare for taste with other breads. So it's important they all agree on the control marks. Six. And five. Okay. Jean, any comments? Um, well, yes, I thought this one was rather salty, which is why I marked it high for overall flavour. Jed? Uh, not very bready, but the flavour was high. So we've got six for moistness, uh, three for hardness, and we'll agree three for flavour and your score sort in a separate Score sheets showing the control marks are given to the tasters to help them score new bread samples. Meanwhile, Christine is in the kitchen preparing those new samples. The panel will again taste the control and then three other breads. Half slices are cut from each loaf to taste for flavour. The crusts are used to taste for hardness, and the crumb for moistness. All the slices are then sealed. The tasters go into tasting booths. Each booth has a hatch on the other side which opens onto the kitchen. 
Christine gives each taster his samples. Slices of the control and the three other breads. Morning. Thanks. The red light in the booth makes sure that the taster isn't put off by the colour of any bread. He can just concentrate on the taste. And each sample is again scored for moistness, hardness and flavour. No cigarettes, perfume, coffee or other foods are allowed in the booths. And the tasters have to mark each sample before they can leave. Afterwards, the score sheets are checked. Richard puts the individual scores into a computer to find an average score for each bread sample. So the bakery can use these results to bake best quality bread. But well, looking carefully at the crust and crumb is one way to judge a loaf. Malcolm observed the judging in Manchester. All these loaves are entries for the British Baker's Shield, the prize for the best white loaf. First, the judges look at the outsides of the loaves and then cut them to observe the crumb. Each judge looks carefully at the crumb and tests it for springiness and to make sure it doesn't break away from the crust. This judge is looking at Coburg loaves. Another judge is looking at a tin loaf. He also tests the crumb and, very important, he smells it for flavour. When the 12 best loaves have been picked from the hundreds of entries, all the judges gather round to decide which is the best. It's quite difficult deciding which is the winner. They check the flavour again. The Coburg's got more flavour. I think the Coburg's got it personally. You see, what I prefer the tin loaf because it's a much better loaf, much better colour, and you can feel that now if you were a feel of that job. So, after a lot of careful observation and discussion, the judges decide that the tin loaf yeah. is the best. Yeah. Here we are. This is the winner, number one. A nice golden brown top. We look inside. The crust is nice and even around the outside. A nice, firm, white crumb. Lovely piece of bread. Well done, son. Bread has been part of our diet now for thousands of years, but it wasn't always so. During the Ice Age, people lived in caves, and from their drawings and the animal bones that have been found in and around their caves, we know they lived almost entirely on fresh meat and water. Only in the short summers would they have been able to gather young shoots and berries to eat as well. Thousands of years later, the climate changed and it became warm enough for more plants, including trees, to grow. People still had to hunt most days for fresh meat and fish, but they also got wild fruits and vegetables more easily, and they still drank water. Over the course of the next few thousand years, something new and important was added to the food large amounts of dried seeds. These seeds helped to change the way people lived in Britain. They cultivated the land to grow these seeds and they also started to keep animals. This is a reconstruction of an Iron Age village where a group of people lived for a year in much the same way as our ancestors did more than 2,000 years ago. Now, 2,000 years ago, people did manage to keep healthy. They learned by trial and error what food was good for them. These ideas were handed on from one generation to the next, and we can learn a lot if we look at the groups of food that they ate. Although they lived a long time ago, these people were just like us. Their bodies needed the same kind of food that we need. And if we look closely at what they ate, we can see that their food divides into the same four groups 
that we eat today. First, there was the food that came from their animals. When an animal was slaughtered, nothing was wasted. All the bits and pieces were made into sausages, and the blood was made into black pudding. Chickens provided meat and a few eggs, and goats provided a little milk, most of which was turned into cheese. So that's one food group, the group that comes from animals. And we call that group the mains group. And these are just some of the foods that we eat today that are in the mains group. Now let's look at another food group that's the same today as it was in the Iron Age. The next group are called fillers. Fillers made up the bulk of the Iron Age diet and they came mainly from dried seeds. Wheat was grown, harvested, and stored, then when needed, the whole seeds, including the bran, were ground into flour. The flour was made into bread, which was one of their most important filler foods. Peas are seeds, and they're another filler food. They were harvested when they were full grown, dry and full of food, not when they were young, like our frozen peas. Nuts, like these hazelnuts, are also seeds, and were also part of their filler foods. So these were the first filler foods, dried seeds that could be stored during the winter and then boil to make a mash or ground into flour to make bread. And nowadays, we still eat dried seeds, but sometimes we buy them ready boiled and canned. And since the Iron Age, we've added rice from India and China, potatoes from South America, and pasta from Italy. All these are very good fillers, but there are some fillers that aren't so good. Fat and sugar are two fillers that we should watch out for. Doctors say we should eat very little of foods that contain fat and sugar. Too much can damage our health. So remember, there are two kinds of fillers, those that are good for us and those that we have to watch out for. So let's look at the next two food groups. The first of these is the fruits and vegetables group. They gathered wild roots and shoots, especially in the spring, and wild fruits such as elderberries. They also cultivated plants such as carrots and parsnips, which would be served up as part of a stew. Stew and gravy are also in the last group, the watery drinks, which also includes milk a useful drink for young children and very old or sick adults. Watery drinks. Water is certainly something we need. Without it, we would die within three or four days. There are literally hundreds of different sorts of watery drink, but most of them contain something else. Milk is part mains, and the cream is a fatty filler, something we should watch out for. Soft and fizzy drinks contain sugar, again a filler we should watch out for. But real orange juice is part fruit and veg. Nowadays we have a much bigger selection than they did in the Iron Age. This group contains all the plant foods that are not fillers. So we eat the same sort of foods that they did in the Iron Age, and they can be divided into four groups. And each group is very important when it comes to choosing a meal or even a snack. No group should be left out. You can find out more about the food you eat, and the Science Workshop book will help you get started.
Here's an announcement for teachers. Teachers who write for material for the class.